In this video, we will cover Study Unit 2, Chapter 2 of BMAR211 Services Marketing, and this deals with managing service quality. Let's cover the learning outcomes for this unit. First, you need to be able to understand quality as a construct of particular importance to service firms, distinguish between product quality and service quality, differentiate between expectations and perceptions, as well as illustrate their roles in customers' perceptions of service quality, then explain the GAPS model of service quality, and then differentiate between the various methods of measuring service quality. Again, I will not play this video in this presentation. It will be linked on Ifundi. Basically, it's a scene from a movie, and this opens the discussion for a service quality perception. It is a scene where the person that you can see on the screen wants to purchase a jewelry item for his wife that is somewhere in the store. And then once you watch the video, you will see there's a comedy streak to it because it's Mr. Bean behind the counter or Rowan Atkinson. And then he takes his time. He makes sure that he is packaging the product efficiently. And then this guy is just impatiently waiting for this item to be boxed before his wife can see or realize what he is doing. But once you watch the video, you will note the funny streak in that. But at the end of the day, that is why quality perception is very important when you have a customer in front of you or when you are dealing with a lot of customers in your service organization. Whatever you do or whatever your service organization does, the perception from the customer side is very important to the success of your business. Right, let's start with the concept of quality and this you can find on page 35. To describe and define quality is not easy because it's down to your own perception and another person's perception can be different. But this author bro, he defined it as a degree of excellence at an acceptable price and the control of variability at an acceptable cost. So if you remember back to unit one, heterogeneity, and then also what you are willing to pay for a certain service, it must be linked to your perception of excellence. You run also identified two dimensions, namely product performance and the freedom from deficiencies, which also links to the previous definition as well as heterogeneity. Then Z. Hamill defines quality as superiority or excellence, but distinguishes between objective quality and perceived quality. Firstly, objective quality refers to measurable and verifiable superiority against some predetermined ideal standard whereas perceived quality is defined as the consumer's judgment of a product's overall excellence or superiority. If you take the smartwatch on the screen, for example, if you look at the price, then you expect a certain degree of excellence and quality for this product because um, it's the Fitbit Versa. When it was released, it was 3.5K, and obviously if you pay that amount of money, you expect superiority in terms of its quality, and you don't expect this product to break. But someone else that has other characteristics, for example, higher income, they will go for the Phoenix 5 or the Phoenix 6, which costs obviously a lot more. And then they will think that this is not as good a quality as a Garmin or a Polar device. So it depends on the person's perceived quality and the objective quality. This is again measurable and verifiable against predetermined standards. Now, what's the relevance of quality? Why is this important? Quality plays an important role in the buying decision of customers and in ensuring brand loyalty and has even been described as the most important consumer trend of all time. So quality is very important if you are manufacturing products or if you are delivering services. Failure to satisfy customer demands for quality is likely to have serious implications. If quality is lacking, no sale will occur because then people will tell other people that this product or company is not reliable and then they will not refer you and you will lose customers. Let's consider the first option in terms of negative or poor quality service. So what is likely to happen? First, you will experience loss of sales due to the superior quality offered by competitors. Secondly, there will be an increase in cost as a result of customer complaints, product liability, the redoing of defective work, and the scrapping of products. So if your product is defective, usually the customer will return it, and then that will cost resources to have that replaced, or then if they don't want a new product, a refund, so it will cost you more money. Next, in some cases, it can also lead to a threat to society. The products of an industrial society exert an influence on the general quality of human life. If you take, for example, a dump site, and if it's not managed properly, that's still a local and public service, 
then you already can imagine the impact that this have on human life. And it is definitely a threat to the health of the society in that environment. You can also consider the opposite of this. For example, high quality service and what this will lead to. Good or superior quality will be to the advantage of an organization and many quality success stories have been reported. So usually you will see this in reviews. Typically, you have lower manufacturing costs, you have higher profit margins and also larger shares of the market when you have high quality outputs. How can you assess your quality? There are five ways or approaches that you can use to assess your service quality. The first one is the transcendent approach and this is covered on page 36 until 37 so make sure you get the detailed descriptions of these approaches. According to the transcendent approach, quality is synonymous with innate excellence, which implies that quality cannot always be defined and is partly a matter of experience. So it will boil down to the customer's experience in that way, with this approach, they determine the quality. For example, spectators who attend a rugby or soccer or cricket or whatever match will have different opinions of the quality of the match which will probably be influenced by their own experiences of the match. If you are rooting for one team, then if the team won, obviously you will have a great experience, but then the opposite is also true. Next is the product-based approach, and this is in line with the approach to quality. So differences in quality are caused by the quantity of features or attributes of a product or a service. This assessment results in a ranking of attributes. For example, if we go back to the smartwatch example, or fitness tracker, or wearable device, or cell phone, laptop, doesn't matter. You will always compare brands to another brand, and then you will make a list of attributes, and then weigh them against each other, and thereby determine the quality of the specific brand and product. Next is the manufacturing-based approach. This approach views quality from a supply side and focuses on conformance to requirements. Every product or service must meet a number of specific requirements to be regarded as a quality product or service. And we will touch on, for example, assessing product quality, where it is easier to assess the quality of a physical product than it is for a service. Second to last is the user-based approach. And then the components of this approach argue that the customer's judgment is always right. So we've heard this before, the customer is always right. And in most cases, yes, this can be true. So in other words, quality is what the customer says it's quality. If they have a bad time at your restaurant, then no matter what you did to prepare great food, it's their experience and that is what they view your company in terms of quality. Lastly is the value added approach. This approach considers quality in relation to cost and price. So the price versus quality perception in terms of the value that you got from the price you paid for your product or your service. Quality is only considered good if the price is acceptable for the quality received or when the price or costs are low. Make sure you review these concepts and be able to apply them to a case study and describe them. Next, we will have a look at Learning Outcome 2, where we look at the differences in quality or perceptions between product and service quality. Product quality is a lot easier. From a product marketing perspective, criteria of what constitutes the term quality, such as performance, durability, conformance with specification, features, reliability, serviceability, and fit and finish can be specified and measured. So it's easy to measure and determine whether a product is of good quality because it's durable, it has better features, it can be serviced, and so forth. Services, on the other hand, if you think back to unit one, services are intangible and customers cannot feel or see or taste them prior to purchasing them. This makes an objective assessment of quality virtually impossible. And defining quality in the service sector is therefore a difficult task and the assessment of quality becomes a subjective process. So again, this depends on what the customer perceives and how the customer feels based on the service that you delivered. The intangibility and inseparability of services make it hard to provide and maintain high quality standards because marketers cannot count, measure or control the standard of service before it is delivered to customers. Because services are intangible and heterogeneous, every customer's service experience and consequently quality assessment will vary every time. The quality of a product is a lot easier to determine and inspect. Um, as you will see on the top left, the products will go through the assembly line and it is checked manually by workers or 
with computer scanning devices or laser technology and the duds are removed from the assembly line. You will also get the link to the video on the right and this is a long video that shows you exactly how Toyota, the car manufacturer, has many people inspecting every inch of a car to make sure it conforms to the standards that they set out. So to sum up then the product versus service quality. In terms of product quality, this is related to technical specifications proven as accurate descriptors of quality, whereas with service quality is a perspective that requires long-term overall evaluation of service performance. The last part of Learning Outcome 2 will deal with defining service quality. One of the first scholars to attempt to define service quality was Christian Gronerus. His definition implied that the quality of a service can be determined by three variables. Firstly, the technical quality of the service, so what was actually delivered. Next, the functional quality, how was it delivered. And then lastly, the image of the service organization. And these three things together will define service quality of the service organization. There was also the disconfirmation paradigm approach, where service quality is the customer's evaluative judgment of the degree of superiority of the service performance. For more detail on this approach, see page 39. But at the end of the day, service quality is a prerequisite for customer satisfaction. If there's no quality in your service delivery, the customer will not be satisfied and vice versa. A further and last distinction between service quality and customer satisfaction is that service quality is an attitude, while satisfaction, on the other hand, is an encounter-specific assessment. In other words, I can have a very positive attitude towards the service quality of, for example, Kalula.com, but I cannot report on my customer satisfaction because I have never flown on the airline. So you can develop a positive attitude for any service, but you can't speak to your satisfaction because you haven't been to the place or used their service. Jumping into Learning Outcome 3, which will deal with service quality expectations, and this is on page 39. First, we need to refer to your expected or your desired service. This, on the one hand, is the level of service quality a customer actually wants from a service encounter and is often the ideal expectation. Sufficient service, on the other hand, refers to the level of service quality a customer is willing to expect. So this is adequate or sufficient service levels. But now we get a creation of the zone of tolerance. So this is what you are able or willing to accept in between that. So you have a certain expectation, but then there's a zone of tolerance and there's a maximum of adequate service where beyond that you do not accept the service anymore. So then in essence, the difference between the desired service level and the adequate service level is called the zone of tolerance. And this can be linked to heterogeneity. I will get into the example shortly. The zone of tolerance is the extent to which customers recognize and are willing to accept heterogeneity in the service delivery. A customer's tolerance zones not only vary between services, but also over time. So as you progress and you've had many experiences with other service organizations of a similar kind, then you reach a point where you do not expect poor service delivery anymore. If you take the picture on the screen, you will see exactly what I mean. Just imagine an ad of KFC. This is hopefully you can see from the right. This is what you expect the burger to look like. But then you go to the shop, you order that same burger, and on the left is what you receive. So then on the right side, this is your expected, and then on the left is what you walk away with, and then eventually you will decide, will this be adequate and sufficient? Will I accept this, or will this just go way past your zone of tolerance? Remember, this changes over time. So because this is linked to heterogeneity, maybe the next day you ordered the same meal, and yes, it looks a bit closer to the advertisement, then you accept it. So maybe when you are a student and you pay 20 bucks for a crunch burger at KFC, you can more or less accept that it will look like the left picture. But as you grow older, you will no longer accept this when you pay a lot of money for food. And this obviously will change your perception over time. So then just to recap, the expected and desired service level, if that is what is delivered, you are satisfied. Or when it goes past this on the left of that burger, then you are dissatisfied. Next, we will refer to the service quality dimensions, and this is a very important part of this unit, as you will need to be able to apply this to case studies and understand the differences between these important elements. On page 40, you will see the 10 original service quality dimensions. So refer to page 40 to get more details on examples. So this included tangibles, reliability, responsiveness, competence, courtesy, credibility, security, access, 
communication and customer knowledge. So these dimensions were very important to determine service quality in the past, but now they've been reduced to five dimensions of service quality, and this is also covered on the same page. And you need to go into detail in the textbook to understand these concepts, and you will also practice them in the activities. The first one is assurance. This refers to the knowledge, skill, and courtesy of service employees and the ability to inspire trust and confidence. Next is uh, the dimension of empathy. This relates to caring and the degree to which customers receive individualized service from employees. So customers all have different needs and you as a service organization employee or manager need to make sure that your employees have the knowledge and care that these individuals need individual or different services from the next customer and actually provide that service. And then reliability, this is a very important uh, attribute or dimension, and this is the ability to perform a promised service dependably and accurately. Next, we have responsiveness. This relates to the willingness of the service provider to listen to the customer and do what the customer wants. So if you take your cell phone back to Telcom or Vodacom or NTN, and you explain to them that it's not working, it doesn't connect, it shuts off, it doesn't do anything that you want it to do, and then they need to have this willingness to listen and deal with your problem. Then lastly, tangibles, which is an easy one. It relates to physical facilities, equipment, and appearance of personnel. So we touched on this a little bit with the service value mix in terms of the physical environment. As a service organization, you need to make sure your physical facilities are on par, and it is a great illustration of your service. Also, the equipment should be in a working and great condition and the appearance of personnel. You don't want to go to a service organization and you don't even know the people working there because they are not differentiated in terms of their attire. So make sure you are able to identify the five dimensions of service quality, describe them and apply them from the case study, as well as read a case study and identify the appropriate elements that were either present or not present. We also refer to customer defined service standards. And this is where expectations are the beliefs about the level of service that will be delivered by a service provider. Also, customer expectations are based on their past experience, word of mouth, as well as advertising. So what you see is what you expect as a customer. It is therefore a challenge for managers to identify service delivery standards accurately. But the following factors should be considered when managing service quality expectations. So these include listening, reliability, basic service, service design, recovery, and consumers. Make sure you cover these elements on page 42. The term customer-defined standards refer to operational standards based on pivotal consumer specifications that are visible to and measured by customers. There are three customer-based standards that can be identified. So make sure you are able to identify and describe the following three customer-defined standards. First of all, hard customer-defined standards. Reliability can be seen as the essence or heart of service quality. If you as a customer do not feel that a delivery company or transportation company is reliable, then you will look for a competitor that is. In order to ensure that this level of reliability is obtained and maintained, many organizations opt for the do it right the first time notion and an honor your promise value system by formulating reliability standards. Next includes soft customer defined standards. These standards are opinion based and cannot be directly observed. These standards do however provide direction, guidance and feedback to employees, thereby enabling them to achieve customer satisfaction and lastly, one time fixes. Many instances occur where a fix is needed. Research or feedback from customers may indicate a need for a once off fix where some changes or amendments to service delivery are required. The one-time fixes can be in the form of technological, policy or procedural changes, which when implemented will address customer concerns. It will also be based on the adaptations to circumstances. From page 43, you will see how you can actually develop customer-defined standards following nine specific steps. The image that you see on the screen is from the old textbook, so use it as a guideline. The steps are discussed in detail from page 43 until 44. So you can just read through those so that you can see how to develop customer defined standards. The last segment of this video will deal with customer perceptions and these include a process by which you as an individual select, organize and interpret information that you receive from the environment. If you went to KFC and it was filthy 
two out of three occasions, your food was great only one time out of the occasion, then you organize this information, you interpret the information, and then you decide that you have a negative experience or perception towards KFC. It is also influenced by customer characteristics, notably what they already know and feel about an issue, in this case, a service. And then not that we can blame ourselves, but over time, such prior knowledge and feelings become expectations. That is, prior beliefs about what something will possess or offer will inevitably become what you expect. So if you know that you will get one out of three meals that are great from KFC, then you can decide to go back and you will know. This is what you've come to expect from this organization and the opposite can also be true. So if you had three out of three great meals from KFC, then you start to expect this type of service and then when you don't get that same experience you will have a bad time and also be dissatisfied. In essence, the perception of quality will depend on a repeated comparison of the consumer's expectation about a particular service compared with the actual performance of that specific service and this you can link back to the example I just mentioned. Another small section as part of Learning Outcome 3 that you can um, read through is figure 2.2 and its description on page 51. This image illustrates the service experience and the factors that will affect customers' expectations of what they will receive. And a brief overview of this, on the top left you will see marketing actions, word of mouth recommendations or people's experiences. And if you listen to someone on a good experiences on a transport service, for example, they create a certain expectation in terms of those 10 variables that you can see, credibility, empathy, reliability, courtesy, and so forth. Then you get to the service experience and then that creates in itself perceived outcomes of the same elements, then you can decide whether based on that created expectation, were you satisfied or not. Then if you were satisfied, you become the person that provides the word of mouth recommendations based on your experience. But if you are dissatisfied, then obviously there was a misconception of the service provider on the part of the consumer. And that is the first part of this unit. Make sure you watch part two of study unit two, chapter two. And if I lost you in between all of this rambling, make sure you reach out so that you understand the work completely. Make sure you also cover all of this work in the textbook because this is only a presentation and a lot of the detail is in the textbook. This is the second part of study unit two, chapter two, managing service quality. And now we will deal with learning outcome five and learning outcome four where we will start with learning outcome five because that is first in the textbook deals with measuring service quality and there are several ways to achieve this. The first method is referred to as the serve qual, so service quality and this comprises 22 perception items and 22 expectation items. So when you start with your postgraduate studies or you have your marketing research module next year, then maybe you will understand what these items refer to. But in short, it's basically items on a questionnaire that you probably have experience with that you filled in in the past. Remember back to the dimensions of service quality, tangibles, reliability, responsiveness, assurance, and empathy are being tested on a like a type scale questionnaire where you read a series of statements and you agree or disagree depending on your perception in terms of tangibles and the rest of the dimensions. So usually it's a five point like it scale ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And this is how you can measure your service quality as an organization. And this has actually been used in the airline industry and several other service organizations that you can easily Google. In essence, service quality, which is abbreviated as SQ, equals expectations versus performance. So what the customer expected from you versus your actual performance is what the service quality will be. If you have a positive score, you will have a satisfied customer because then your performance outweighed their expectations. But the opposite is also true. If you have a dissatisfied customer, you will have a negative score and then the expectations was a lot higher than your actual service performance. Before I get into the example, you have to review the value and criticism of using SurfQual. And this is on page 48 to 49, where you will see, for example, that the value of SurfQual can include the customers are used to establish a benchmark as they provide relevant and reliable information about service perception. So when they fill out these um, questionnaires for you, it provides a benchmark as to where you stand in terms of your service quality. And then, for example, a criticism, this model is only suitable for service organizations like travel agents, but it is not suitable for organizations that offer tangible products 
like clothes and space, hence serve qual. It is the quality of services, not products. Just to illustrate kind of what this question is all about. So on top you will see serve qual is the measuring instrument and you will see the five dimensions. There are four items that they use to measure the tangible. So let's take a travel agency as an example. So do they have up-to-date equipment? Agree or disagree? Are their facilities visually appealing? Do they have well-dressed employees? If you answer, for example, a three, then, you're, then they are kind of in between. And then are facilities consistent with the industry? If you take, for example, assurance, are the employees trustworthy? Do the customers feel safe in their dealings? So, for example, are they fearful of losing their money? Do they have the assurance that their money will go towards what they are um, planning in terms of their trip and travels? Are the employees polite? And do the employees have support to do their job well? So this is what you as a customer will fill in for a specific company, let's say an airline or any other service. And then at the end of the day, they can determine whether their actual performance reached your customer expectation and this isn't just something that's in theory and in a textbook it is actually being implemented in real service organizations but now there are also two alternative approaches to measure your service quality the first one is the serve perf so performance only this should look familiar to you you can also think with regards to a robot system so green lights yellow light or orange light and then red light and that you can use as a gauge to review or rate a specific service organization so it can be in a five point like it scale so um how do you feel about the service then you can say oh well it was a four out of five or so then a three point simplified scale which is the example on the slide and this is also figure 2.1 on page 50 so they can ask you Please rate my service. I know FMB uses this. It's a one pager they give you after a consultation and you can rate them by circling a face. Another way is the importance performance approaches. This is covered on page 50 to 51. So just read through what all of these quadrants mean. The last topic that we will cover for this unit is learning outcome four. And this is the gaps model of service provision. And this is the gaps model of service quality. And this again, also, it's not just a concept in theory. This is also being implemented in various service industries and a quick Google search will reveal the industries that um, use this GAPS model and you will also find a lot of videos on the internet, especially YouTube, on the GAPS model. But for the purpose of this module, stick to the information and the GAPS as described in the textbook, but you can always use other sources to add to your knowledge. Now, the five GAPS which we will touch on in detail, first is the knowledge GAP, standards GAP, the delivery GAP, the communication gap and the overall service gap. Refer to page 53 to see this image and follow the scheme to understand how the arrows work and how the gaps exist. I will provide a brief description of these gaps and you have to make sure that you read all of the detail starting on page 52. The knowledge gap reflects the difference between customers' expectations and the organization's perceptions of those customer expectations. So what you need to know in terms of the gaps model is what the gaps are, first of all, identify them, what each gap means, and then also how to close the gap. So strategies the service organization can use to close the gap. So a quick example of this, if you have DSTV or Showmax Pro, for example, as a customer, you would expect new content on a general, regular basis, but then management thinks that customers expect repeats. And then there's a knowledge gap between what the customer expects and what the organization, which is then DSTV or multi-choice think customers expect. And this is the knowledge gap. How can they close this gap? So DSTV, multi-choice or any organization that experiences this gap can close the gap by developing a better understanding of customer expectations and perceptions. And a practical way, which you should also think of, is they can conduct research, ask customers on their social media pages, what do you expect of us? And then obviously they will comment and then multi-choice, any service organization, can close this gap because now they have a proper understanding of what their customers expect of their service delivery. Next is the standards gap. And this refers to the difference between the organization's knowledge of the customer's perceptions and expectations and the service standards that are in place. So now they have conducted their research. They know exactly what customers expect. For example, they want the latest series um, expressed from the U.S., they want to be notified on their apps that uh, a new season has released. They also do not want that many repeats. Okay, so multi-choice now, they know this, they have this knowledge. 
but their service standards does not allow for this knowledge and hence a standards gap exists. So even if they know that customers want new updated releases, it is not written into their standard procedure and then the gap exists. The gap can also occur because of insufficient standardization of tasks, absence of goal setting, inadequate management commitment. So there's a lot of different scenarios where a standards gap can be created and this depends on the type of case study and the type of scenario that the service organization finds themselves in. At the end of the day, they need to set service goals. So organizations need to set or establish goals of standards to guide employees' actions and behaviors and to deliver a consistent and high quality service. These goals should be based on customer needs and expectations. So once they have the knowledge of the customer expectations and needs, they need to train employees so that they can close the standards gap. And hopefully now you can answer how this gap can be closed. Next, we have the delivery gap, and this is a lengthy gap that requires a lot of attention for any service organization, because as a service organization, the delivery of your service will greatly affect the quality and perception and satisfaction of your customers. So this is the difference between the organization's service standards and the actual service it provides to customers. But now, even when an organization has implemented certain service standards, it is still not sufficient to provide an excellent service to customers. So yes, you can have great customer service standards, but it doesn't necessarily equate to excellent service. An organization still has to ensure that adequate and sufficient and effective systems, processes and people are in place to ensure the service will be delivered and delivered properly and that it will match the expectations of the consumer. So on paper, in a manual, you can have set out standards, but you still need to train the people and make sure it is actually delivered properly. How does this gap occur? It occurs due to ambiguity regarding employee roles. There are conflicting roles, so it overlaps and still there's confusion. Poor employee job fit, and this happens unfortunately a lot. There's also a lack of teamwork. For example, one person would want to take over everything, or there are people that do not want to work as hard, and then that creates um, confusion, frustration, and also a lack of teamwork. There's also inappropriate supervisory control. So if you as a supervisor do not take control over your uh, sub-employees or your subordinates, then the delivery gap can most certainly occur. An important part of this gaps model is how to close the delivery gap. And you need to be able to practically provide suggestions for a company on how they can close this gap. Starting on page 54, you will see several examples. I will mention them and you have to make sure you cover them in detail. To close the delivery gap and provide a service that will exceed the standards or expectations of the customers, the service organization or you as a future service organization manager must provide your employees, that is now the service provider or your subordinates, with the required knowledge and skills. So in detail on page 55, you will see what is meant with this knowledge and skills. You should also provide active and emotional support, improve internal communications with your staff, reduce conflict. Uh, a company that is grounded in constant conflict cannot be successful and deliver adequate service, much less satisfactory service. And then you also need to empower your employees to act in the customer's and organization's best interest. The communication gap has also created a lot of issues for many service organizations besides the many negative outcomes of the lack of proper communication product organization. For the purpose of this, we will focus on service organizations. So the communication gap then is the difference between actual service provided and the service promised through external communication. An excellent example that I just saw on, on social media was RAIN internet or 5G internet or even their fiber. In RAIN's communication, they promise fast internet, reliable internet, and yet people complain constantly about the poor reception, poor service provision, and the poor speeds of the internet, as well as the quality of the internet. Then you need to make sure that when you have communication externally to customers, that it is definitely achievable, where you know that you can exceed the expectations as you have communicated. When organizations are more realistic about the services that they provide, customer expectations can be managed effectively to close this gap. So all that RAIN internet or RAIN service provider should communicate is that, no, we do not have an active customer service center. You can send us an email and we will take up to 30 days to deal with your request. Then the customer does not expect immediate feedback. 
it is already communicated that they should not expect that. But if you communicate that it's fast, we help you till the end and it doesn't happen, there's obviously a miscommunication and your customers will never be satisfied. The communication gap that occurs will raise customer expectations and result in customer dissatisfaction if the business does not deliver, as with the example of RAIN. How can you close this gap? Communicate appropriate messages to your future customers or your existing customers. Do not overpromise, rather underpromise and overdeliver, and then you will always have satisfied customers. Do not supply any marketing communication or on your social media sites and not deliver on the service that you promised in this communication. And that's as simple as that. That is how you can close the communication gap. Then lastly, the service gap. Basically, all four of the other gaps contribute towards the service gap. So it is the difference between customer expectations and the perceived service from the company. If you do not have appropriate communication and there's a communication gap, if you don't have appropriate service standards or you are not sure or have the knowledge of what your customers expect and you don't deliver on your, first of all, your promises or based on what your customers expect, then you will definitely experience a service gap and then this gap can be closed by ensuring that all of the other four gaps are closed. And that's the gaps model. So you can also refer to uh, page 52 to 56 to make sure you cover this in detail. Be able to identify the five gaps, describe the five gaps, and when reading a case study, be able to identify the specific gaps in the case study as well as provide methods of how to close a specific gap for that particular case study. And that's it. That was the end of uh, Study Unit 2, Chapter 2, and now you will see a massive summary. This is also in the textbook, and we have covered a lot of elements in this video, so make sure when you summarize the work, summarize according to the learning outcomes and the page numbers provided on the slides. Again, if you're not sure about some of the content, please make sure you send me an email so that I can provide a further explanation. You can also attend the odd Zoom sessions to ask your questions, but best is just to send a message and I can get back to you to make sure you understand the work properly.